Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Gynecological Cancer Initiative Research Rounds. My name is Almira. I am a research coordinator with GCI and help with the organization with GCI rounds. We had some technical difficulties in our last uh, GCI session, so we are recording um, this talk post factum. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take some time to acknowledge the traditional unceded territories that we are uh, each joining from today. As some of you can tell, we are implementing the hybrid research rounds model and have um, people patching in from all over the place. For those who are um, in the room, uh, we are all joining uh, in from the territory of the Coast Salish people. And those are the territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, and I invite you all to take some time to acknowledge these territories that you are joining from today. So without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Amy Jamieson. Dr. Amy Jamieson is an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of British Columbia and gynecologic oncologist at Vancouver General Hospital and BC Cancer. She completed her, her obstetrics and gynecological uh, residency at the University of Otago and her gynecologic oncology fellowship at the University of Sydney and UBC. She was the first recipient of Miller Mendel Translational Research Fellowship with Off Care and um, the Gynecological Cancer Initiative. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll pass the microphone to you, Dr. Amy Jamieson. Okay, so thank you um, very much for that introduction. So my talk is titled The Continuing Evolution of Endometrial Carcinoma Molecular Classification, and we thought it was um, a good time to give an update on the progress that's been made in this area over the last few months. So for my talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the progress that's been made in terms of the most common endometrial cancers. So that's the NSMP subtype and the most aggressive endometrial cancers, which are the P53 abnormal endometrial cancers. And then, then I'm also going to cover ways of improving access to molecular classification for all patients with endometrial cancer. So endometrial cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer in Canada. And unfortunately, the incidence and mortality are increasing globally at quite alarming rates. At SGO last year, the study was presented showing that uterine cancer mortality is now neck and neck with ovarian cancer mortality. And this is because of advances in ovarian cancer, but stagnation in uterine cancer with alarming racial disparity. And then at SGO this year, the study in the US looked at National Cancer Institute funding allocation for female reproductive cancers during a period from 2011 and 2018. And this study's primary outcome was, it was a funding to lethality score. And this is a metric that standardizes cancer site incidence, mortality, and years of life lost to measure disease burden. And you can see that despite uterine cancer mortality being on the rise, research in uterine cancer remains significantly underfunded. You can see it receives less, far less uh, funding than breast cancer and less funding than cervical cancer. And again, with this racial disparity present. But on a more positive note, we have seen great progress since the Cancer Genome Atlas discovery of the four molecular subtypes of endometrial cancer that was in 2013. So following this discovery, a clinically applicable tool called PROMISE was developed and validated for clinical use. And this was by work by our BC team and also by a team in the Netherlands. And then by 2020, Molecular classification in, in endometrial cancer was endorsed by the World Health Organization and recommended to be integrated into routine pathology reporting. And then by 2021, it was incorporated into major international clinical guidelines. So briefly, just to recap on the four molecular subtypes, polynutant endometrial cancer, this is the least common subtype. We see this in approximately 8% of patients with endometrial cancer. Mismatch repair deficient or MMRD, we see this in just over one quarter of patients with endometrial cancer. Half of all endometrial cancers fall into the subtype of NSMP, no specific molecular profile. 
and about 15% of P53 abnormal. So for patients with polymutant endometrial cancer, these tumours are often described as a sheep in wolf's clothing because adverse prognostic parameters are common in these tumours, such as the presence of lymphovascular invasion, there's often deep myometrial invasion, these tumours are often high grade, but these parameters are not associated with outcomes in patients with polymutant endometrial cancer. And several studies now have shown these patients have excellent outcomes, even in high risk disease, and this is regardless of adjuvant treatment given. And patients with polymutant endometrial cancer now have the option of de escalation of therapy, therefore, avoiding unnecessary chemotherapy and radiation. And we eagerly await the uh, results of prospective studies assessing the safety of de escalation in. Um, patients with polymutant endometrial cancer. So these are studies such as Portec 4A and the TAPER slash EN10 trial, um, which was initiated here in BC and now includes the polymutant blue arm of the rainbow um, clinical trial umbrella program. For patients with mismatch repair deficient endometrial cancer, we know that radiation plays an important role in this molecular subtype with studies showing no apparent benefit from chemotherapy used in patients with high-risk mismatch repair deficient endometrial cancer, and that was seen even in patients with stage 3 disease. We know immune checkpoint inhibitors have become a very important treatment option in this molecular subtype, and we know that identifying patients with mismatch repair deficient endometrial cancer is a very important way of screening for Lynch syndrome. But more work needs to be done with NSMP and P53 abnormal endometrial cancer. So why is this? So NSMP is the most common molecular subtype. So like I mentioned before, it accounts for half of all endometrial cancers. And although most NSMP tumors are indolent, there is diversity in the histomorphology, molecular features, and the clinical presentation and outcomes. And because of this diversity, it's, a, it's currently a hard group of patients to treat. More work needs to be done in P53 abnormal endometrial cancer because this is the most lethal subtype and although it only makes up approximately 15% of all endometrial cancers, it accounts for approximately 50 to 70% of endometrial cancer mortality. So let's first start with NSMP. So like I mentioned, majority of these tumours are indolent but there is significant diversity, diversity and I think these three examples of NSMP tumours highlights this diversity well. So let's consider this first scenario. If you have a 40-year-old patient with a grade one endometrioid NSMP tumor, we know from the study that molecularly classified a cohort of young women with endometrial cancer. You can see, sorry, it's a bit blurry here, but the patients with NSMP tumors in yellow, these patients had excellent outcomes, almost as favorable as patients with polymutant endometrial cancer. And it would be very reasonable to offer this kind of patient hormonal therapy if they wished fertility preservation because we expect them to have such excellent outcomes. Compare this to a 55-year-old patient with a grade 3 endometrioid NSMP tumour. We know from this study that molecularly classified a large cohort of grade 3 endometrioid endometrial cancers. You can see the NSMP tumours in this cohort have more intermediate outcomes. And then if we consider a 75-year-old patient with a clear cell NSMP tumour, again, based on the study that um, molecularly classified a cohort of clear cell carcinomas, you can see that NSMP clear cell um, tumours, so these are patients represented in yellow here, these patients had very poor outcomes equivalent to P53 abnormal clear cell tumours. So, you can see that one treatment approach for all NSMP endometrial cancers is, is clearly not appropriate with given this diversity. So what factors then can be used to stratify prognosis and direct treatment in this molecular subtype? So we recently studied a cohort of over 1,100 NSMP endometrial cancers and our aim was to um, try and identify a low risk and high risk subset of NSMP endometrial cancers based on either single or multiple prognostic markers. And we looked at various clinopathologic features, we looked at molecular features either assessed by immunohistochemistry or next generation sequencing, 
and we found that there were several factors associated with outcomes on univariate analysis. However, we were able to pare it down to just two critical features, and that was tumor grade and estrogen receptor status. And we found that this combination of having an ER positive tumor that was low grade, so that's either FIGO grade one or two, this was able to identify a subset of NSNP endometrial cancer patients at very low risk of disease recurrence or death from disease. We called this group low risk NSNP. And you can see the five year disease specific death rate across all stages was only 1.6% and it was only 1.4% within stage one. And the remaining patients fell into a group that either had ER negative tumors and or grade three tumors, and this was able to identify a subgroup of NSMP endometrial cancers where these patients had worse outcomes, which we called high risk NSMP. You can see the five year disease specific death rate was 22.9% in this cohort compared to only 1.6% in the low risk cohort. So these Kaplan-Meier plots here show outcomes, so both progression-free survival and disease-specific survival in these low-risk and high-risk NSMP subsets. And you can see we saw this significant difference in outcomes when we looked at all-stage NSMP tumors. We also found a significant difference in outcomes when we just looked within stage one NSMP tumors. So what we found is that low-grade and ER-positive NSMP endometrial cancers are a homogeneous low-risk group associated with exceptionally favorable prognosis in which either de-escalation and or endocrine therapy strategies could be applied. We also found that this low-risk NSMP group was the most common type, so 84% of NSMP tumors fell into this low-risk category. So this means that together polymutant endometrial cancer and the more common low-risk NSMP endometrial cancer essentially encompass half of all endometrial cancers that could benefit from treatment de-escalation. And this um, you know, work needs further validation in an independent cohort, and we're working with an international group to do that validation work. We also found that high-risk NSMP endometrial cancer includes rare high-grade histotypes, such as gastric type and mesonephric-like adenocarcinomas, and is responsible for most NSMP-related deaths. And how do we treat these patients with high-risk NSMP endometrial cancer? There's no data to suggest they benefit from chemotherapy used in addition to radiation. So this was seen in the molecular analysis of the Portec 3 trial. We also found the same looking at our own data, no benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. So we were awarded a TerraFire grant um, led by a team led by Dr. Jessica McAlpine. As part of this grant, we're undertaking a multi-omic analysis for the identification of features that will hopefully allow stratification of these clinically aggressive NSMP endometrial cancers. And hopefully by studying the biologic processes that drive these aggressive tumors, we'll be able to discover paths to targeted therapies. So the same week that our NSMP paper was published, the, the Portet Group and, and Leiden published the study where they assessed 648 high-risk endometrial cancers. So that was a cohort from the Portet 3 trial and a, another Dutch prospective cohort. And they were looking at the independent, independent prognostic value of various markers across all subtypes of which they didn't find any prognostic value. But on subgroup analysis, they were able to show in patients with high-risk NSMP endometrial cancer, ER positivity was independently associated with a reduced risk of disease recurrence. And you can see in this Kaplan-Meier plot from their cohort of 648 high-risk endometrial cancer patients, you can see patients with ER positive NSMP tumors in yellow here had very favorable outcomes compared to patients with NSMP ER estrogen receptor negative tumors in purple, you can see these patients had poor outcomes um, equivalent to aggressive P53 abnormal endometrial cancers. And they proposed that this should be added to the endometrial cancer molecular classification algorithm, this additional step of stratifying NSMP tumors by estrogen receptor status. So what changes have we made as a result of these two recent papers? So 
we have now recommended that around the province, all endometrial cancer biopsies should reflexively have immunohistochemistry for mismatch repair proteins, P53 and estrogen receptor. So again, this is now routine, should be performed on all uh, endometrial cancer biopsies in the province. And rather than saying that all patients with grade one endometrial cancers are able to be managed in the community versus all patients with grade two endometrial cancers have to be referred for management in Vancouver, we now have a more um, stratified triage approach. We now know that majority of patients with grades two endometrial cancer actually have excellent outcomes, providing they are estrogen receptor positive tumors, mismatch repair, proficient in P53 wild type. And when they meet this criteria, you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve here, patients with grade two tumors have equivalent outcomes to patients with grade one tumors. And this fits with the, recommend uh, sorry, the uh, WHO recommendation for a binary grading system. So the WHO recommends grouping grade one and two together. So what this now means is that patients are able to stay in the community and be managed by general gynecology as if they have a grade one and grade two tumor, that's endometrial histotype, as long as they meet the following criteria. So the tumor must be P53 wild type, NMR proficient, estrogen receptor positive, and they have to have apparent clinical stage one disease. So let's move on to P53 abnormal endometrial cancer. So Again, P53 abnormal rep represents the most aggressive tumours, and I think there is often a misconception that P53 abnormal endometrial cancer equals serous carcinoma. And yes, most serous carcinomas are P53 abnormal, but you can see from this figure here that serous endometrial cancer only makes up approximately half of all P53 abnormal endometrial cancers. You can see all histotypes are represented here in the subtype, even a proportion of low-grade endometrioid tumors. So we know from data from the molecular analysis of the Portec 3 trial, and then our own data looking at a cohort of 2,500 endometrial cancers that have been molecularly classified, that patients with P53 abnormal endometrial cancer have improved outcomes when adjuvant chemotherapy is used in addition to radiation. And although the importance of chemotherapy is generally accepted in patients with advanced stage P53 abnormal endometrial cancers. I think there's less certainty in some centers regarding treatment within patients with stage one disease. And I think there's also less certainty around treating all P53 abnormal endometrial cancer histotypes, such as non-serous histotypes. Um, again, I think within serous histology, the importance of chemotherapy has generally been more accepted. So in our study, we were able to show that adjuvant chemotherapy is associated with more favorable outcomes for patients with P53 abnormal endometrial cancer. And that was seen even in patients with stage one disease and even in non-serous histologies. And this data supports the recommendation from many international guidelines now that state that all patients with P53 abnormal endometrial cancer that have myometrial invasion should be considered high risk and should be treated with adjuvant chemotherapy plus or minus radiation. And this should be done regardless of the stage and histotype. And that's recommended now in the ESGO guidelines, ESMO. Our own BC cancer guidelines have also been updated to re reflect this recommendation. And I think having a molecular directed treatment is important and our study included over 400 patients who had P53 abnormal endometrial cancer. And when we compared how patients were treated at the time of their diagnosis, so in a pre-molecular era with an older system of risk stratification, as compared to how these patients would be treated today following guidelines with molecular subtype information added, we found that almost half of these patients, so 47%, so that was over 200 patients, um, did not receive any uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. So these patients were possibly undertreated compared to how they would be today based on current guidelines. So, you know, this potentially these patients had a missed opportunity for, for adjuvant therapy that could have improved their outcomes.
I think there's, there's also some debate as to whether radiation plays a role in the management of P53 abnormal endometrial cancers with the ESMO and ESGO guidelines now saying that chemotherapy alone can be considered. And we were able to demonstrate in patients with high risk P53 abnormal endometrial cancer that combined chemo radiation, um, those patients had significantly um, and better disease specific survival compared to patients who had either radiation alone or chemotherapy alone, suggesting that perhaps maybe perhaps radiation does improve outcomes when it's used in addition to chemotherapy in this molecular subtype. So what about low grade tumors? So previous studies have reported that a subset of endometrial cancers have the contradicting diagnoses of being low grade, so that's FIGO grade one or two, um, and being the P53 abnormal molecular subtype. And there's, there's been debate as to whether these cancers are truly low-grade endometrioid or whether they represent misclassified glandular variants, variants of serous endometrial cancers. And there's also a question about how these tumours behave compared to other low-grade cancers. So to try and answer these questions in collaboration with the Portet group, as these tumours are uncommon, we've analysed a cohort of low grade and stage one endometrial cancers that were found to be P53 abnormal molecular classification. And these a, um, proportion of these tumors were confirmed to have low grade morphology on blinded histopathologic review. And we found these tumors have a five year occurrence rate of 29.5%. And remember this is patients with grade one and two and stage one tumors and majority were actually stage 1A. So these are patients who we would normally uh, expect to have excellent outcomes, often cured by surgery alone. Okay, so how about targeted therapy options for this molecular subtype? So let's start with anti-HER2 therapy. So based on the result of a phase two clinical trial by Ananth Theta, the NCCN guidelines now recommends that all patients with stage three and four serous carcinomas and carcinosarcomas be treated with chemotherapy plus trastuzumab. And we have found that 21% of P53 abnormal endometrial cancers are HER2 positive when we did immunohistochemistry chemistry on whole sections. And we found this across all P53 abnormal histotypes, so not just serous carcinomas. We also found a large range of intratumoral uh, heterogeneity when we did the um, IHD on whole sections, and this is demonstrated in this figure here. All of these tumors are HER2 positive with three plus staining on IHC. You can see tumor D here, there's only 7% tumor staining compared to 30% in tumor C, 80% and 100%. And HER2 intratumoral heterogeneity and its effect on response to anti-HER2 therapy has not been assessed in endometrial cancer like it has in breast and gastric cancer. And we have a, um, a current project looking at this to see if we can determine a HER2 positive tumor cutoff um, that would indicate response to anti-HER2 therapy. How about HRD and, and PARP inhibitor therapy? So James Brenton's lab in Cambridge uh, was the first to show that shallow whole genome sequencing can uh, be successfully used to derive copy number signatures in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And they identified two signatures associated with homologous recombination deficiency. And using the same methods, we have performed shallow whole genome sequencing in a cohort of P53 abnormal endometrial cancers and found that 26% of them had one of these two HRD related signatures. And we know PARP inhibitors are, can be used in addition to chemotherapy in uh, the rainbow red arm of the rainbow um, um, trial program and also CANSTAMP um, being run out of PMH. So what about anti-angiogenic agents? So this data published from the NRG um, showed that uh, GOG86, which assessed the addition of upfront bevacizumab to chemotherapy, overall the study did not show improved outcomes. However, on subgroup analysis, they found that combining chemotherapy with bevacizumab did improve both progression-free survival 
and overall survival for patients whose tum tumours had a P53 mutation. We're currently uh, developing an angiogenesis panel, which we'll use for multiplex immunofluorescence IHC, which will be performed on a cohort of P53 abnormal endometrial cancers to see if we're able to detect a biomarker that may be associated with response to anti-angiogenic agents. What about immune checkpoint blockade therapy? So in 2019, a team from BC assessed the immune landscape across the four promised molecular subtypes in a, in a cohort of endometrial cancers. Um, immune markers were measured using multiplex immunohistochemistry and clustering of tumour infiltrating lymphocyte patterns enabled identification of till high and till low signatures. And although a higher proportion of P53 abnormal tumours were immunologically cold compared to polymutant and MMRD endometrial cancers as expected, surprisingly 60% of P53 ab um, abnormal tumours were actually found to be till high suggesting that there's a, maybe a reasonable proportion of these endometrial cancers that could benefit from immune checkpoint blockade therapy used alone rather than the combination of immune checkpoint blockade plus an anti-angiogenic agent such as the, the pembrolimbatinib combination which we know can be, can be toxic to patients. And currently we don't have strategies for identifying though which patients may be eligible for um, immune checkpoint blockade therapy used in isolation. Okay, so just to recap on this first part of my talk, so in terms of progress made in the most common endometrial cancer, the NSMP subtype, we've found that two key features, so that's estrogen receptor status and tumor grade, are able to discern a low risk and high risk NSMP subset, enabling stratification of clinical care. We hope to validate, we plan to validate these findings, and we hope this means the group of patients eligible for treatment de escalation can now be dramatically expanded. In terms of progress in the most aggressive endometrial cancer, so that's P53 abnormal, we have further data to show improved benefit from the use of adjuvant chemotherapy on this molecular subtype. That's even in patients with stage one disease and non serous histologies. Although uncommon, low-grade stage 1 P53 abnormal endometrial cancer does exist and are associated with an increased risk of disease recurrence um, and again supporting um, molecular classification in all endometrial cancers. And we hope that in the future there will be several opportunities for targeted therapy for patients with these aggressive tumours. So now I'm going to move on to how, ways of um, improving access to molecular classification for all patients with endometrial cancer. So who should we be testing? You know, ideally, all patients with endometrial cancer would have access to molecular testing, but one major barrier for many centres has been the cost and access to the poly testing. So this project led by Naveena Singh, we assessed a selective promise algorithm where all patients were tested with P53 and mismatch repair immunohistochemistry, but we restricted poly testing. So we defined a very low risk group, so that included patients with grade one or two endometrial red tumors that were mismatch repair proficient P53 wild type stage 1A with no LVI. So poly testing, you know, would obviously not impact patient care in this very low risk group, and hence why they were not tested. And we applied this uh, testing algorithm to a cohort of over 900 endometrial cancers, and we found with this restricted testing, poly testing would not be required in 38% of all patients with endometrial cancer, with, which is obviously a significant proportion. And reassuringly, we found that this very low risk group with unknown poly mutation status, these patients had excellent clinical outcomes that were comparable to that of, of patients known to have pathogenic poly mutations. And that really just confirmed that poly testing is not required in this cohort. Um, as these patients had excellent outcomes, they didn't need adjuvant treatment, it would not impact their care. And following this paper, we published this algorithm with the British Association of Gynecologic Pathologists that now recommends that all endometrial cancer biopsies should have 
uh, MMR, P53 and ER performed on all cases, again, regardless of the histotype. And um, it provides guidance for restricted uh, poly testing just to cases where patient care would be impacted. And we've adopted a very similar testing strategy here in British Columbia. We now have BC Cancer funding to test essentially all patients with stage one and two endometrial cancers around the province, except patients where adjuvant therapy would not be required. So what are, what are other options? So our colleagues um, in Leiden have developed a, a rapid, simple and low cost quantitative PCR assay for detecting pathogenic polymutations. You can see in their uh, first cohort, they, they tested this, the sensitivity and specificity were, very, were excellent, so 92% and 100%. And they have um, tested this on a validation cohort and that paper is due to be published um, very soon. So in addition to the cost of poly testing, what are other challenges with the, with the PROMISE testing algorithm? And so to assign a PROMISE subtype without restricted testing, then all components must be available. So that's poly mutation status and then mismatch repair and P53 immunohistochemistry. chemistry. And this is uh, required to detect the approximately three to five percent of endometrial cancers that are called multiple classifiers. So that they have more than one molecular feature. Often components are performed at different stages of care and possibly at different centres, which can result in delays in, in management plans. And finally, we know reimbursement can be challenging as well as these different steps of immunohistochemistry chemistry and next generation sequencing can. can come from different resource allocations. So a common example for us is that uh, mismatch repair immunohistochemistry is often performed on the biopsy at the community center of origin. And until very recently, the P53 immunohistochemistry was usually only requested after these patients were referred to BC Cancer and it was performed at, at BC Cancer. And then the next generation sequencing for poly was not is not performed until after surgical staging at Vancouver General Hospital. So this is now a third different hospital. So by the time you get the results back from these three components at three different hospitals, the patient may have already been referred for adjuvant therapy with a missed opportunity to act on this molecular information. So one way to overcome uh, this problem with, the, with promise in terms of the components being performed at different stages of care and at different centres is to use a single test DNA based endometrial cancer molecular classifier. And we worked with a local company to develop Promise NGS. So for Promise NGS, DNA is extracted from formalin fixed paraffin embedded tumour. And then next generation sequencing is performed for poly mutations, which is unchanged from the original Promise. It's also um, performed to look for T53 mutations, which is um, replaces the P53 immunohistic chemistry and it also is, performs a, um, a microcellular instability assay replacing the snatch repair immunohistic chemistry. We know from previous studies that there is some discordance from these methods so when you compare mismatch repair IHC versus using an MSI assay or T53 mutation sequencing versus P53 immunohistic chemistry there is some discordance and in the literature that ranges from around 5 to 9%. And there certainly is pros and cons of both ways of testing. So we assessed uh, the concordance metrics and prognostic ability of this single test DNA-based molecular classifier compared to the original uh, multi-step PROMIS classifier. So PROMIS NGS was assessed in 164 endometrial cancers and we found that 159 out of 164 of these cases were concordant with a CAPA statistic of 0.96% and an overall accuracy of 97%. And in 15 cases, we were able to perform PROMISE NGS and match biopsy and hysterectomy specimens from the same patient, and these were concordant in all 15 cases. Perhaps even more important than the concordance of, of PROMISE versus PROMISE NGS, subtype assignment is that the prognostic value of PROMISE NGS was maintained. So you can see recapitulation, um, recapitulation of the cancer genome atlas survival curves in both the original PROMISE and then 
um, as seen again in Promise MGS. So in summary, with, in terms of Promise MGS, we found an um, excellent concordance of, of this single test DNA-based endometrial cancer molecular classifier when we compared it to the multi-step original Promise classifier. Importantly, the prognostic value was maintained. We showed that this can be accurately performed on preoperative endometrial biopsies. And because you get the results from a single test, it would um, you know, avoid management delays that we often encounter. Further validation is, is needed before we can implement this into clinical practice. And we're working with an international group to do that validation work. And obviously, the cost effectiveness is a very important aspect, and this is currently being assessed. So I would just like to thank all my colleagues who we have collaborated with on these various projects. And thank you.